As the work of Mark Fisher grows in popularity, and his ideas are being wrestled with, shared, and perhaps misunderstood through memes, a question has come to haunt millennial and Gen Z shitposters alike. If I pass the joint, would Mark Fisher accept? The question is largely rhetorical and refers generally to a passage from Fisher's breakthrough work, Capitalist Realism, which, in a world of increased tolerance towards psychoactive substances, radiates big boomer energy and a disdain for youth culture, even the very students he clearly wishes to reach. Fisher wrote the following, Students are aware that if they don't attend for weeks on end, and or if they don't produce any work, they will not face any meaningful sanction. They typically respond to this freedom not by pursuing projects, but by falling into hedonic or anhedonic lassitude, the soft narcosis, the comfort food oblivion of PlayStation, all-night TV, and marijuana. Though should we be surprised by or even disagree with such a statement, sure, it plays into a not entirely untrue stereotype of the chronically stoned, Though Fisher's observations arguably go beyond the mere scapegoating of potheads or dismissal of the benefits of cannabis use. In order to understand what Fisher is saying, we need to understand the structural relations that underlie the behavior he is critiquing in the first place. Let's continue to read in order to examine who these students are by Fisher's own assessment. Primarily, he takes aim at their inability and a lack of desire to read an act which they find boring. Ask a student to read for more than a couple of sentences and many will protest they can't do it. The most frequent complaint teachers hear is that it's boring. Though, Fisher continues, that boredom actually reveals something else. Less linked to any actual disdain for books and more associated with the mental conditioning undergone by young minds at the hands of advanced capitalism. To be bored simply means to be removed from the communicative, sensation-stimulus matrix of texting, YouTube, and fast food. To be denied, for a moment, the constant flow of sugary gratification on demand. Some students want Nietzsche in the same way that they want a hamburger. They fail to grasp, and the logic of the consumer system encourages this misapprehension, that the indigestibility, the difficulty, is Nietzsche. Capitalism has so far hollowed out young minds as to make the literal act of philosophizing or reflecting impossible. There is no objection to Nietzsche as such, but to things that are difficult in general, and those things are rejected as somehow superfluous or even obstructive to the immediate sense of gratification that capital encourages and ostensibly satisfies. But what if we don't care about Nietzsche? Or philosophy? Is this just a matter of changing taste, or a more general shift in societal consciousness? Let's move from the intellectual to the intimate to further illustrate the spirit of the thought. Does Fisher's rant against headphone-wearing, spliff-smoking students not sound similar to Eric Fromm in The Art of Loving? Man's happiness today consists in having fun. Having fun lies in the satisfaction of consuming and taking in commodities, sights, food, drinks, cigarettes, people, lectures, books, movies. All are consumed, swallowed. The world is one great object for our appetite. A big apple, a big bottle, a big breast. We are the sucklers, the eternally expectant ones, the hopeful ones and the eternally disappointed ones. Especially today, with intimate or romantic relationships being increasingly linked to social media, dating apps, and modification. Some people want a love life like they want Burger King, customizable and homogenous at once, stripped of the difficulty and complexity. Fromm says, love isn't something natural. Rather, it requires discipline, concentration, patience, faith, and the overcoming of narcissism. It isn't a feeling, it's a practice. This is the same sentiment as when Fisher says that the difficulty is Nietzsche. 
He is stressing the process of labored thought itself as something that can oppose commodification. Knowledge, like love for Fromm, cannot be bought and easily consumed. It requires a sustained engagement between the subject as student and the world as object to be understood, often by reading books. When commodified and delivered by the desire machine of capitalism, this process loses its noble sense of worth as well as its capacity to act on the student, demanding from them growth and change. It's worth noting that the cited passage from capitalist realism reflects on students in the UK during the post-Thatcher neoliberal era, what Fisher called market Stalinism. The students are caught in a role that demands they are both subjects of disciplinary institutions and consumers of services, while the teachers are expected to be both disciplinarians and entertainers. As discipline wanes in wider society and students lack guidance in anything other than how to be consumers, the role of the disciplinarian is left to the tutor. So the problem here should be read not as a problem with the students' habits, but the impotent and impossible role teachers occupy in this system and their structural inability to meaningfully interact with it. When reading Fisher's irritation with headphone-wearing students, I personally sympathize by thinking of my time working a cash register and trying to interact with headphone-wearing customers. Trying to deal with the distracted customer, it becomes apparent that the cash register is not a tool I am using, but rather, as a cashier, I am an extension of the cash register. Educators are becoming just another service industry employee, and this proletarianization leaves them increasingly at the mercy of market forces. I can understand the urge to chastise the student, yet he risks a paternalism that sounds out of touch. Zizek has often talked about the perils and hidden totalitarianism of the postmodern permissive father, who does not force you to go to your grandmother's house, but reminds you how much she would love it if you chose to visit. What presents itself as a choice becomes even more repressive with the guilt of the superego that regulates desires as well as outcomes. This is a valid critique of the new form of authority present in the liberal communism of Silicon Valley and tech startups, which in reality amounts to capitalism with a human face. Which is why Zizek prefers the modern father slash paternalistic authority that gives the demand because I said so, as it is more honest to the power operations at hand. This dynamic, along with the cheapening and degrading of education as a whole, is perhaps why Fisher appears to lean towards the role of the disgruntled father. The goal is not to successfully adapt to the new situations of capitalism and manage its excesses, but to overturn and move beyond capitalism. However, meme producers have perhaps missed the subtlety and complexity of Fisher's argument. Later in the cited chapter, Fisher does do a slight U-turn, acknowledging the losing position of the call for a return to authority, saying that any opposition to flexibility and decentralization risk being self-defeating, since calls for inflexibility and centralization are, to say the least, not likely to be very galvanizing. In any case, resistance to the new is not a cause the left can or should rally behind. Utilizing the communicative sensation stimulus matrix of technology through experimentation and collaboration is surely part of this process as the growth in video essays on YouTube and left-leaning podcast memes and streams since the writing of capitalist realism attest. Fromm and Fisher alike might point out the entertainment factor at play in the output of the online left today, stressing that they are being consumed as just another option next to top 10 list, reaction videos, and celebrity gossip. Though algorithmic trickery aside, it is important to note that they are willingly being consumed sometimes by students as supplemental material to dry lectures 
or by working class folks as educational entertainment, but they are not just assignments from authority figures. It's worth noting that the transition to the fast-paced and entertainment field aesthetic of today's online left is strangely reminiscent of the theory blogging era of the 2000s, in which figures such as Fisher with his blog K-Punk, Graham Harmon, Levi Bryant, and many others took to the web to disseminate theories that weren't liable to be featured in academic journals. Such shifts in the format that theory is produced and consumed in challenge the hegemony of academic power, and it would arguably be unwise for anyone with a genuine interest in mass left movements or mass education to stand in the way of anything that increases access to left ideas. Not one person prominent in the blogging community, which was most active from around 2005 to 2012, is active in the left tube, bread tube, or meme communities. However, the enthusiasm of these theory bloggers for using the available tech of their time to spread leftist theories suggests we ought to embrace today's new tech and new media in order to disseminate left theories and actions. Going back to the issue of cannabis use, or drug use in general, we can look at Fisher's K-Punk post, Chronic Demotivation, from 2004, where he argues that stoners' only commitment is to the pleasure principle, to the shortest route to total relaxation. Thought, thought requires effort, man. Stop oppressing me. Let me sit here and babble senselessly which is incredibly harsh and probably short-sighted. But a close look also shows it is an attack on a specific culture. The type of person who will persistently tell their friend with anxiety that they just haven't tried to write straight, bro. Could the same be said of the anti-war protesters of the 60s and 70s? Or Walter Benjamin, who wrote about his experiences with hash, as well as experimenting with opium and mescaline. Not to mention the interesting story of William James, father of modern psychology, who claimed it was only through inhaling nitrous oxide that he understood Hegel, after building a career refuting Hegel. Or Michel Foucault, who called his LSD trip in Death Valley the greatest experience of his life, the latter being a partial influence for Mark Fisher's last unfinished work, acid communism. Fisher ends his rant against stoners saying, the obvious counterexample people will reach for is Rastas and Dub. But the Rasta relationship to Dope was very different to that of most white workers toking on their time off. It was not only that the level of downpression to which the Rastas faced was much greater than the hard week of the white worker it was that their consumption of drugs was part of a disciplined, religious, and political ritual. Exactly the opposite, then, of those who turned to dope as a means of fugging out the world. This does leave open the possibility that pot used in the right way can have a meaningful role in building a challenge to capitalism. Though it makes many assumptions about what the average Rasta and average white working pot smoker does. Could a white or any other worker not smoke weed and have an illumination that leads them to become a socialist? We at the acid left certainly hope so. Perhaps Fisher's thought simply developed and changed between writing capitalist realism and starting his unfinished work, Acid Communism the title of which is suggestive of an openness to drug experience. The introduction published in the repeater compendium called K-Punk gives few clues as to what an acid communist movement might involve, and even fewer to the role hallucinogenic drugs might take. We do know that we are faced with a political situation that calls for action, rather than simply smoking weed and gaming, or, to be fair, reading Nietzsche. And here, if discipline seems a word too burdened with conservative forms of hierarchy, we at the least need a sustained and organized effort to teach and learn, forming along the way alternative modes of working and living, 
Psychoactive chemicals are not necessary for such a project, but they have their place along with music, art, meditation, and class consciousness building exercises. Fisher made a significant contribution to this cause, and was right to point out the risk in a culture that makes it difficult to read and think constructively. The diligent work needed towards the organization of a new society needs to draw influences from far and wide. Read Nietzsche while you're high, if that's what gets you off. Then make a meme about it. The acid left welcomes you aboard.